Okay, uh, uh, good morning and thank you for being here. Uh, as uh, Luis said, I'm a research professor at the India Network, which is a research center in Madrid. It's funded by the Comunidad de Madrid, so, but uh, uh, we're an international center. We, uh, I mean, essentially we have a faculty and students from all nationalities, and uh, we're always looking for students and, uh, and new recruits. So if uh, anybody's interested in doing a PhD with us or a postdoc or, I don't know, come on work with us, uh, think about it. Uh, this is joint work with a bunch of uh, uh, researchers, uh, Vicente from Jaume Primer, Chris and Georgiou from uh, University, of, uh, University of Cyprus, Kishori in uh, Broad Institute in Boston, Nicolas is in Algolis, is, is a company, Michelle is in uh, uh, Irisa, and uh, Rus Antonio Russo is a student of mine. Um, and essentially what I'm gonna be talking is, uh, it's, it's kind of a personal story. In um, 2016, 2017, I went to the Media Lab to do um, a, a, a sabbatical, and when I was there, I started hanging out with uh, people from the Digital, uh, Digital Currency Initiative, who do um, uh, essentially, you know, blo blockchain-based finance, right? And uh, I started asking them. I, mean, I knew about you know Bitcoin, and you know this is something that you know as a distributed uh, systems guy I should be interested on, but I never really got interested in it. Uh, and they, they were telling me you know how this you know what is this, how it works. I said, come on, this is a distributed system. So how come I don't know about it? So I started talking to them, and uh, you know well first you find out that you know. Uh, the people think the blockchains are going to solve all the problems in the world, you know, starting with uh, hunger and uh, climate change, whatever. Um, but then you start asking questions and you realize that uh, experts don't have clear answers. Or at least at that time, I didn't get any clear answer. Like, you know, I was asking questions like, you know, um, uh, what kind of model are you assuming, you know? Uh, what kind of failures are you assuming? Um, what kind of service are you providing? Uh, you're, you're implementing a cryptocurrency, like let's say Ethereum or uh, Bitcoin. Uh, is that really necessary? These kind of questions are really hard. And then uh, when uh, you were asking like very, very specific questions about the mechanisms that they were using to solve, uh, very often you had to go and look at the code of the implementation. You know, they're very often for these uh, blockchains and cryptocurrencies, they have white papers. Uh, and uh, if you want to really go beyond the white paper, you have to go and read the code, which is a little bit annoying, I, I, I would say, especially for me who haven't been programming for many years. Um, so this problem of not being formal and especially not using, you know, not standing on shoulder for giants. You know, there have been giants working on distributed systems for many years, you know, why not use that? Was something that actually was in parallel noticed by uh, a giant of distributed system, which is Maurice Hurley in, uh, in uh, 2017. He noticed that, you know, uh, they sh we should introduce, um, or we should understand uh, in the same way that we understand Paxos and we understand uh, uh, Byzantine general's problems, you know, we should understand, you know, how, what we're dealing with here, right? Um, so, after discussions with some of my co-authors, we came up with something that we tried to say, okay, let's start with the basics. You know, what is the simplest abstraction that kind of captures what blockchains are? First thing, I don't want to call it blockchain because blockchain is, you know, the fact that you have blocks, you have transactions grouped into blocks, and these blocks are linked with hashes and blah, blah, blah. That is an implementation detail, okay? I don't want the details of the implementation, I want the API. What is, the, what is my API? My API is essentially what I have is an object that I'm gonna call it a ledger object, and uh, the ledger object has a state, it's a concurrent object. So I'm gonna have clients that are going to operate on that object. They're gonna be issuing operations using the API on that object. The object is going to maintain a state. And the state is, simple, is simply a sequence of records. I'm not, I don't wanna call them blocks because they don't need to be blocks. They could be transactions, they could be whatever, whatever the application that uses the object wants it to be, okay? 
And uh, I put arrows here just because people are used to see blocks collected by arrows. But essentially what you have here is a, is a linked list, right? It's a list, okay? Uh, and the state of the list is whatever is in the list. Uh, the state, the, and then uh, I, here I'm giving only two operations. The important one is the append operation. This is the only operation that changes the state. And all you can do in this object is to put a new record at the end. Okay? And then here I'm, I'm adding a get operation that in my case returns the whole object, so you can inspect it. Uh, but you could replace this get with the query language uh, that uh, for logs that Roland was presenting in the previous talk. Or you can, you know, here you can do whatever query operation. You're just, just like looking at the state. But the important thing is that you can only modify the state with this append operation. Okay? So uh, then uh, essentially the model is that a, a client can issue an append operation. The append operation has an effect. It returns a response. Then when this client goes and checks what is the state of the object, he gets, he gets it and uh, that's it. Okay? Quite simple, right? How do I implement this? Well, I could do a very simple implementation just by using one server. So I can have a central server that has uh, this, uh, this maintains the state of the object and takes all the queries from the clients, in, uh, executes them, and uh, returns control. Simple. Um, if I want, okay, and this this object, actually, uh, I, I, won't, I won't go into that, but uh, uh, we we said okay. We can do something a little bit more sophisticated and have a, what we call it a validated ledger. What is a validated object, a validated ledger? One that only appends a record if, if the record is valid. So you can add here a validity check. And that validity check could be the validity check that Ethereum has. And then I can use this, this uh, ledger to uh, have a smart contracts and run a cryptocurrency. Again, essentially, this is a very powerful object if I add this functionality. But let's forget about it for now. I'm going to use it only to store um, application-dependent records. And the application takes care of what is inside, OK? Um, of course, having it centralized is no fun. I want to have it distributed. So then I want to have the state actually being stored in multiple servers. They keep replicas of the of the of the state. So if one of them crashes or fails in any form, you know, I'm, I can I can recover. You know, I don't I'm not doomed. Okay, but the interface is the same. The API is the same. Uh, the only issue is that then I need to uh, to specify what kind of guarantees I need. In the centralized case, everything is beautiful. In the distributed case, I need to have certain properties. I mean, the first property that I want to have. And this is not something that is provided by blockchain, um, uh, blockchains, classical public blockchains like Ethereum or Bitcoin, is to have a, what we call a strong prefix. A strong prefix means that if I have two clients and they are interacting with my distributed ledger, they are talking to some server that has a copy of that uh, ledger, they may actually get different uh, uh, states. They may get different versions of the object. Like this first client gets five records, while the second client gets four records only. However, what it must be guaranteed is that no matter where and when these clients do the get, what they get, the sequence, the list that they get, one should be a prefix of the other. So once a record is seen by somebody, it's there forever in that position, okay? As I said, this is not something that uh, Bitcoin or uh, Ethereum guarantee uh, uh, right now, but this is what we want. I mean, once we see that we cannot implement this, then we can maybe relax. But let's see what I want. I want an API with a very clear uh, collection of properties. Then we go into something that is a little bit more complex to explain. I mean, I'm probably most of you know about what consistency is, right? So essentially, uh, here I'm giving you two levels of consistency. You can define others. You know, you can have causality. You can have sequential consistency. So we, in this talk, I'm going to be focusing only on two, in two of them. 
One is linear stability, also by Herlihy. Uh, how many of you know what linear stability is? Good, okay. Essentially, linear stability is you want your distributed object to work as a centralized object from the external point of view. Like, if I'm here and I append a record in a ledger now, if one second later somebody in Australia does a get, that uh, query should see my record. Okay? Strong guarantees. Uh, of course, again, that is not something that is provided by, by current um, uh, uh, blockchains or most of these permissionless public blockchains. Um, they do something a little bit weaker, which is close to what I call here eventual consistency. What is eventual consistency? Well, if I append a record right now in the ledger, eventually, eventually all the get operations will see it. Eventually may mean one year later. And again, that is something that is not even guaranteed by, by uh, current blockchains, permissionless uh, public blockchains. But, but this is what I want, okay? And depending on the application, I need, I will need the linear stability. In other cases, I will settle with eventual consistency and that will be strong enough for me to have a, you know, use, use this as a, as a useful tool for my applications. Of course, uh, I've been talking about uh, uh, distributed implementation without saying, you know, what could happen about the, the servers. But servers can crash, can fail. Uh, moreover, I claim that the, the interesting application of all this technology is when you have an environment in which the clients want to collaborate, but they don't trust each other. You know, we've been seeing a lot of talks, and you will see a lot of talks in which uh, there are solutions for distributed uh, problems in which all the entities that are involved in this distributed system belong to the same company. That's good. I mean, unless you are, you are hacked, it is very unlikely that any of these entities will misbehave unless it, there is a problem in the programming, you know, th there's a bug in the program or something. But in general, you know, the, the, the failures will be benign. They will, not be, they will not be malicious. These objects are meant to be used in an environment in which uh, the entities that are using them are willing to collaborate, but they don't trust each other. And therefore, you need to introduce mechanisms to tolerate Byzantine failures or make assumptions like that they are greedy rational and they are never going to shoot themselves on the foot uh, but they may be willing to go out, you know, outside the, you know, um, legal path, and they, they may not follow the algorithm that they are supposed to be following because it's on their best interest not to do it. I don't know, I just, just to give you an example, you know, I could, uh, this, is, uh, this is something uh, a couple of years ago, they passed a law here in Spain in which every company needs to record the entry time and the exit time Essentially, you need to punch in and punch out uh, 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 at work, right? And they need to, in order to keep track of, you know, how many hours you're working per week. That could be kept in the ledger. Most, most companies were doing now, they have a database. And when you punch in, you know, they record uh, your punching in. When the, you punch out, you record the punch out. But the database is completely managed by your company. Imagine your company wants to fire you. And they want to do it so they don't compensate you, they can just go ahead and delete all your records. Oh, this guy has not showed up in one month. If I have a ledger, I distribute it. I maintain one of my servers. You know, I'm an employee of the company. I, main, I have a server you know, in, involved in this maintain, maintenance of the ledger. My union has a copy. The Ministry of uh, War or Labor has a copy. My company has a copy. And none of us, you know, once, once my punching in record or my punching out record is there, nobody can touch it, nobody can modify it unilaterally, I'm safe. That bad scenario cannot happen. That is a one example, a very simple example in which these kind of objects could be useful. Okay? Um, 
Okay, so now we have uh, the whole picture. We want ledgers, distributed, and Byzantine tolerant. Can this, with, with uh, strong prefix, and linearizability or eventual consistency. Can this, can this be implemented at all? So the question is yes. Uh, we, have a, we have an implementation in which using uh, a known set of servers, so we are fixing the, the collection of servers. This is not a permissionless system like you know, uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum. We're talking, you are in an environment like the one I was describing in which there are like, you know, five, seven, 10 servers, all run by people they know, that know each other. All, all of them have the certificates or uh, uh, public key of each other. So they can you know, uh, exchange messages in a, in a trustable in a way, some say. Um, we believe that no more, I mean, the less than one third of these servers can uh, fail Byzantine. However, any client can fail. We don't care about that because we are we have mechanisms that tolerate that. And uh, um, and and we are able to achieve linearizability. You know this uh, behavior as if you have a central entity, there only one server implementing it. But we, of course, we based our uh, implementation on a service that is what we call Byzantine Atomic Broadcast. Byzantine Atomic Broadcast basically is Byzantine consensus, if you if you uh, if you're more familiar with it. Byzantine Atomic Broadcast, what it does, it guarantees that uh, I broadcast a, a, a message and everybody gets the same message, and all the messages are received by everybody in the same order. Everybody, I mean, like those who are honest and they behave properly. Byzantine uh, uh, servers that could do pretty much whatever they want, okay? Uh, so here is where the key, the magic is, uh, is hidden, and also is where the complexity is hidden, of course. Uh, we have an implementation of this. Uh, uh, so this box here, for this box, we use Tendermint, which is the consensus box of uh, Cosmos. Uh, but uh, we have another implementation of, uh, of an algorithm that implements a set consensus, Byzantine set consensus, which is called Red Belly. And uh, essentially, I mean, we have it running, and we have been doing experiments with, uh, with a system like this. Um, with the implementation using Tendermint, which is essentially, essentially we're using a, a whole blockchain to build on top of that a ledger, what we get is a throughput of roughly like uh, between two and 300 uh, appends per second which is okay, I mean, no, it's not like. Um, now, let me change gears a little bit in order to justify the next object that I want to introduce. Uh, this has to do with the fact that, um, as they say about the weather, you know, if you don't like all the blockchains that exist right now, just wait five minutes and there will be a new one, okay? So what is this saying? that having a single worldwide blockchain is completely unthinkable. You know, it's nobody, nobody thinks that that's gonna ever gonna happen. So we have to live with the fact that we're gonna have millions of different ledgers, blockchains, call them whatever you want, and therefore we need to find ways to interconnect them. You know, have operations that somehow involve multiple of these, many of these, ledgers on blockchains. Now, uh, the most common and the simplest uh, operation that one may, one may think is uh, what we call atomic swap. Uh, what is atomic swap? I mean, the simplest scenario is the one you see in the bottom. You know, there are two ledgers or two uh, blockchains. One uh, is uh, keeping track of the ownership of cars. The other one is implementing a cryptocurrency. And client A, has a car whose ownership is recorded in the first ledger. Client B has money, crypto money, and is willing to pay some of that to A in order to receive the ownership of the car, okay? So they want to do this in a safe way, meaning none of them uh, cheats the other, but they don't trust each other, you know? So this is the example, another example of this, I want to collaborate, because I'm willing to exchange you know, my car with your cryptocurrency, 
but I don't trust you. Because if I give you my car, if I give you the property of my car, how do I know that you're going to transfer me the money afterwards? And vice versa. So in a game theoretic point, from a game theoretic point of view, the Nash equilibrium of this game is doing nothing. Okay? So we did study this problem in the context of uh, these ledgers. How, how, how do I translate this into my uh, uh, content oblivious ledgers? You know, ledgers in which the records contain data that only the application knows. Well, essentially, instead of uh, essentially, what you want to do is you want to uh, append a record that transfers the ownership of the car in one ledger, and you want to uh, append a record that has the transaction of the cryptocurrency, the amount of uh, cryptocurrency that you agreed upon, uh, in the other ledger. So what I want to have is I want I, the append, atomic append problem is the one in which you know client A has this record transferring the ownership of the car. Client B has this record, transferring the money, the payment of the car. And you want to devise an algorithm that is able to guarantee that both records are appended if client A and B are correct. And if any of them is not correct, okay, um, the other one doesn't lose anything, which means that if the record of a correct client is appended, so if B appends, it's only if the other one was appended. So it's either both of them are appended or none of them is appended. That's kind of the translation of the atomic swap into my lingo and my data structure. Okay? So we, we have a paper in which we prove a bunch of uh, game theoretic uh, problems like this. Uh, so introduce game theory and we combine it with crash failures. And what we, sh we show is that essentially if they have to be the ones that are appending directly in the ledgers, you know, they cannot delegate the append operation, then uh, uh, as soon as they can crash, things don't work. I mean, there's no guarantee. Even if they both, I mean, in this, this example I was giving, uh, uh, they're competing. But there are examples in which both of them want to actually uh, complete. So there's no, you know, the Nash equilibrium is, if, if there are no failures, the Nash equilibrium is, I append, and I, I, I know that the other one is going to append as well. But even in that case, if they can crash, they're, they're, they're bad situations. So the solution we came up with is using an auxiliary DLO, an additional ledger. And that additional ledger is the one in which we're going to store the willingness of completing the operation. So essentially what you, want to, you don't want to have is, you don't want to have one client appending and having the other one crashing and not appending. What you want to have is the append, one append only happens when you're guaranteed that the other one is going to happen. So in that sense, what, the, what we proposed, it, it is not the best solution in the world, probably. I mean, there has, you have some issues. And maybe you can come up with better ones. But the one we came up with is, OK, let's do the following. I'm going to have another ledger in which every each of the two clients writes down the willingness of uh, complete this transaction and gives the basic data. And let us have a, a collection of trusted, some trusted entity be the one completing the transaction, appending in the name of these two entities. Okay? So, so we're going to have. Um, an, 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 an additional, an uh, auxiliary uh, ledger in which the clients append their willingness to participate in the transaction. So I'm, I'm A, I'm involved in a transaction with B, and this is my record. This is, the, this is the operation that should be written in my ledger in order to transfer the property of the car. Uh, I forgot to say that the, you know, this is typically solved. The atomic swap is solved in, uh, in blockchains using the smart contracts. Uh, it uses smart contracts. It uses the possibility of uh, putting uh, uh, money or, uh, or the car in escrow. And usually they use time locks, meaning that uh, the, if one of the clients is not continuously checking the state of the transaction, they may lose the window and they may actually lose the money or the car. 
So well, the solution we're putting is actually completely asynchronous. You don't have that risk. Uh, so what we assume is that uh, you know the clients are going to append this in a, in this ledger, and then we're going to have a few helper processes that are going to be the ones completing the transaction. Here you're describing the transaction, and these guys here at the right are going to be the ones checking that the the, both sides of the transactions agree and everything is fine. Kind of that's kind of what uh, what the what what is happening. Okay, but the, as I said, this is not probably not the perfect solution. It's just like something that you know, you know, hand, um, uh, works works uh, in s most scenarios. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but notice that I'm not I'm not putting the cut in escrow. Uh, the, the these helpers, they may find. I mean, I I, I won't go into that, and I don't want to go into all the possible uh, variants that this can happen, but. Okay, let, me, let, me, let me complete the way it works, and then we can, we can talk about that particular scenario. So essentially, B is saying, OK, here I'm B. I'm, I'm, I'm in the, involved in this transaction with, uh, with A, and this is my record. And yeah, probably we should add here some additional metadata describing you know, what, what you're supposed to expect from, from A as well, you know? uh, because I'm buying this car you know, for this price, and blah, blah, blah. Then A does the same. And now it doesn't matter if uh, A or B crash. Like, if any of them crashes before writing, nothing happens. If they, they crash after that happens, the whole thing, you know, the whole machinery is already moving. So they don't need to do anything else. Now, these are the helpers. We, we assume that the helpers are not reliable individually, but they, you know, there, is, there is enough of them who don't fail in order to guarantee that everything works fine. And we assume that the, this DLO can be only written by the helpers. That this, this A and B cannot write here. Okay, um, uh, these assumptions are a little bit, a little bit simplistic. One may say, you know, we can, but uh, let's, let me let me use it as a motivation example. Okay, uh, so the helpers go, they check, they see that everything is uh, is correct, and they just go ahead and complete the transactions. And as long as uh, two of them are operational, this, you know, this DLO is configured, so the code of the DLO is a little different, so only the helpers are allowed to write, and there has to be a majority of them writing in order to the, the append operation to actually, I mean, write, append, uh, the, uh, a majority of them has to happen in order to the append operation to actually complete. As you were saying, um, the difference, I mean, we're not really putting anything in escrow here because, um, uh, B or A, I don't know, B may not have enough money, or A could have sold the car. After doing this, the point is that the helper should check that everything is correct before, before uh, doing it. But they're, 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 they can be trusted, not individually, but in an aggregated form. But I mean, I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to defend that this solves all the problems of the world. I mean, that's, it's just like a, a motivating example for the next, uh, the next uh, object that I, I, I'm proposing, which is, OK, you have this example. And uh, what we did is we used this ledger with total order and uh, you know, uses, uh, uses uh, consensus to implement that total order. But hey, you don't need order. You don't really need order, right? So why not, instead of using an object, a ledger, that maintains total order, why not inventing a new object, which has similar properties as the ledger, but doesn't have any order? So that's what we did. We proposed what we call a, a distributed set object, which is essentially a grow-only set, and that was strongly inspired by the, the grow-only set by uh, CRDTs. And uh, um, essentially, what, uh, what the DSO is, uh, is a set. Okay, so this solution could be just solved in the same way. You just, A puts this record in the set, A, uh, sorry, B puts the record, A puts the record, and then the helper uh, processes just go ahead and complete the work. So the point is that there, there is more there than ledgers and total order. You know, there is also sets with no order. And in some applications, collaboration, competition scenarios, you don't really need order, okay? That's kind of what, uh, what this slide or what this example was trying to say. Um, so what is the interface? What is the API of this uh, new object? 
same one as before, but instead of having an append operation, you have an add operation that adds a, 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 a record in a set of records in the object, correct? So you, I mean, you add, you get the response, uh, you get you get the response. Okay, now what is what is important about this object is that these sets don't need consensus to be implemented. You know the reason why you need consensus to implement a ledger is the total order. You remove the total order, you you don't need consensus anymore. That means. You go from uh, a throughput of, uh, in our experiments, a throughput from like 200 uh, that I was mentioning before to uh, the order of uh, thousands and thousands. Okay, so you can uh, add uh, in the, op I mean, you can add uh, op um, issue operations add and have a throughput of, uh, uh, I believe, uh, tens of thousands of adds in one second without any problem. Okay, uh, can this be implemented? Yes. Uh, essentially, what you have here is pretty much the same scenario we had before, a permissioned uh, system with bits and team failures. All clients could fail, no matter about that, so the system is public. However, what I'm replacing is I'm using a Byzantine reliable broadcast service instead of an atomic broadcast. And a Byzantine reliable broadcast, there is an algorithm, there is an old paper by somebody called Braca, um, who uh, implemented this already, uh, this is the uh, 80s, 90s, like really, really long time ago. Uh, and it doesn't need consensus, okay? And now there is a lot of activity in uh, POTSI and DISC, like the, do, the two conferences in uh, Principles of Distributed Computing on how to uh, come up with better, more efficient uh, Byzantine reliable broadcast uh, 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 algorithms. But essentially you don't need consensus. You can do, you can do things much faster. Funny thing is, when we were working on this distributed set object, we found out that uh, another object that is interesting is a ledger in which only one client can write. Essentially, it's like a personal ledger. And you say, why is, why, why, why is that interesting? Well, first, because you don't need consensus to implement it. There's only one writer, so there's, there's no need to put people together and agree on what is the order. The order is, is given by the client who's owner of the ledger, right? You know, I'm the one who decides what is the next record. So I don't need anybody to do it. Uh, but more importantly, it can, it can be useful in many applications. For instance, the application I was telling you about punching in and punching out. You know, if I'm punching in and punching out, you know, my records, my punching in records and my punching out records could be held in a, in a, in a ledger that only I can write. There's no need to put that in a, in a ledger in which others can write because that only introduces dependencies that are artificial. In particular, it was shown a couple, a couple of years ago that you can implement cryptocurrencies without consensus. This is my version of implementing cryptocurrency without consensus using these single writer ledgers. This is, this is, this is uh, where, I mean, this has not been published yet, and this is not the way uh, Gerawi and co-authors implemented the uh, cryptocurrency, but this is my way. And my way is that every, every account has its own ledger and is recording all the transactions out from the account. Okay? All this, the state of the account is just, you look at all the ledgers and you see how much money you transfer out, how much money I was transferring, in, and you know the balance. Okay? So, here, for instance, the balance is one, because I had initially six, I transfer out four, and I transfer out one, I transfer four to A, I transfer one to D. So the balance of A is I six, because he had three, he transferred out one, but he got four from here. And you don't need consensus for this, okay? Of course, let me go quickly now, because uh, I'm uh, getting short of time, but uh, Essentially, you know, you see, you see how it works, okay? So, just to conclude, uh, I'm presenting objects that try to formalize what blockchains are providing, the services that blockchains are providing with, uh, you know, a given API, but I'm trying to do things in a much, at least to me, in a much simpler way and in a formal way. So, essentially, these objects and the properties that these objects have we have papers showing 
that those properties actually hold. Okay, we're running in uh, where we have de we're developing uh, in, uh, prototype implementations. They don't need to be efficient. They just they are just proof of concept, and uh, we are running uh, evaluation on uh, how much we gain by not having to solve consensus and so on. Um, uh, what I think is more interesting is this slide, which is future work. And this future work is more like a long-term or mid-term vision. Uh, my, my point is that I showed distributed ledgers and I showed distributed sets, but there's a whole world in between. I introduced linear stability and I introduced eventual consistency, but there's a whole world in between. So you can define many uh, Byzantine tolerant objects that implement other abstractions, and they provide other uh, guarantees in terms of uh, consistency, and they will be useful in different contexts. And I think these objects could be something that uh, anybody who wants to uh, develop distributed systems uh, in which you have uh, companies or entities that are collaborating but they don't trust each other should have in their toolbox. Okay? Because they're going to be useful, I think. Um, these are my uh, ways of contact. These are uh, four papers showing part of what I was uh, showing here. And uh, just a, a piece of uh, uh, marketing. Uh, we just published this, uh, I mean, I edited, I co edited this book uh, last year. Uh, is uh, essentially it's a collection of chapters written by different people. Uh, Barbara Liskov is co-author of one of the chapters. Uh, Maurice, uh, uh, with Maurice, uh, we have a chapter by Juan Garay uh, on uh, consensus. So uh, they are economists. So I don't know if you if you are interested. Is is very um, scientific, I would say. So don't expect to see a lot of code. And, uh, and, and or solutions for like practical problems. So it's like more like principles, as the title says. And let me go back here so you can you know see the. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, thank you very much, Antonio, for the presentation. It was very clear to follow even though the topic is quite complex. Uh, do you hear me well, if I speak? Yeah, okay. My question is regarding this uh, eventual consistency principle. Uh -huh. uh, I think you mentioned that in this uh, uh, ledger where you have order, uh, that, that is possible to achieve. But in this new approach that you are suggesting where we have no order, how can you guarantee this eventual uh, consistency principle if there is no order? Oh, eventual consistency is, uh, is uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in the set abstraction you're talking about. It's the same. I mean, you have add operations and you have get operations. As I said, you know, get, you can replace get with any query function that you want. The point is, if I add a record in my set, eventually everybody who gets and accesses the uh, state of my set should see my record. It's, uh, it's natural. Actually, every time I was uh, trying to explain eventual consistency in databases in which you can do updates, writes, and reads, it was very hard to explain because you have to say, yeah, if nobody writes anything else, the state of this particular record doesn't change, and this is the state that everybody should see. So you need to make certain assumptions. In this context, Eventual consistency is much clearly and simply stated. You know, if you append, eventually everybody will see your append permanently. If you, in a set, if you add an element to the set, everybody will see the element after a certain point in time, everybody will see the element permanently. Nice, simple, I like it. I like the micro ledgers. You, you state that you can only modify a micro ledger by removing things. So giving away money, for instance. Uh, no, maybe, no, I mean, a micro, micro ledger essentially is, is a ledger implemented in a very like lightweight form. 
Uh, so you, you can remove the micro ledger, but I mean, you get everybody together and say, okay. Oh, sorry, we, when you change the ledger, you're, you're deducting money from the ledger. But how do you I mean, add I'm, money to the ledger? I don't have money in I, the ledger. Okay. There's no, there's no cryptocurrency at all in my, in my model. Okay. I mean, I, I showed implementing cryptocurrency as an example. But, uh, but my, my data extraction is a data extraction that doesn't require, uh, doesn't assume any money or cryptocurrency anywhere. Sorry, sorry for the, sorry no, if okay. I, I, I just thinking, how can I trust your micro ledger when, if I need to? So the, the modification to the ledger, I can modify it myself. It's on my phone. I can just add money to my own. Account. Oh, you're talking about the, the, the cryptocurrency implementation I was showing? Maybe I'll talk afterwards. Yeah. Uh, okay. This one. In, in this one? Yeah. Okay, because I can, all I can do with my micro ledger is to send money to other people. I can never, I, I can never put money in my, in my pocket. So how do I know my balance? Because I will have to have access to everyone else's ledgers yeah. to find yeah. when they send me money. Yeah, so yeah. In this particular case, I'm assuming that all the ledgers are public. I mean, public meaning they're, they're all visible. Okay, so I could query everyone else's, all the millions of ledgers to find the ones that have given me yeah and what you get is uh, what you get is a lower bound because there, there could be transactions that you don't see when you ch which, when you query that are because they're still in the making but that happens also with your bank statement you know you go to the bank you check your balance and say oh i know my brother sent me some money but the money has not arrived yet of life i mean yeah uh, sorry, so I, I I I didn't understand you. This is this is yeah. yeah this, this is this is the question I was having. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank I will you. be around. So if anybody wants to ask questions. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Big applause to Antonio, please. <laughs>